Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tunnel Vision, a show brought to you by uscfootball.com. I'm your host, Keely Orr, joined alongside Ryan Abraham, and hopefully Shotgun Sratling soon. Don't know where he is, but he'll, he'll be here, hopefully, uh, if he's not oversleeping. Hopefully uh, soon. Yeah, hopefully soon. But today, we will be previewing USC's road matchup against the Arizona Wildcats. Another road test for USC. Hopefully, they can get it done on the road. They haven't yet this season, so that's something to watch for. Uh, we will be talking about practice this week. We did see the return of full pads for the first time in two weeks. We also saw the return of tackling drills. Some, some actual live tackling, Ryan. Pretty shocking, I know. Tackling. I said, that's a good idea. And and then, <laughs> Sorry, I'm pulling this up on Periscope to make sure you guys are there. So well, you're, that, you're on. Yeah. That's a great segue. We will be monitoring all your questions and comments on all three platforms, uh, Periscope, YouTube Live, or YouTube Streaming, and Facebook Live. I think it's YouTube Live. I don't YouTube know YouTube Live, all of those. Uh, so We're live sure on all three. All three, a, a trimal cast, if you will. So be sure to put in your questions. We will answer them. Uh, we're going to be talking about how do you stop a guy like Khalil Tate Maybe he's already stopped a little bit by his, his ankle slash the scheme he's he's in right now. Yes. Uh, and then we're going to talk about something that has been missing from the USC's defense. Uh, lack of sacks. They did lead the nation last na uh, last season in sacks. Not getting it done so far this year. And they haven't really had a lot of turnovers. Not that I don't think they've gotten an interception yet on the season, which None. is pretty crazy. We did see a lot of interceptions in practice this week, so maybe that will carry over. Is that not good? sure. Not sure. But uh, <laughs> Ryan, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. I'm just my buddy Shotgun here next. Oh wait, no, he's not next to me. Um, yeah, well, we, so we, Keel and I did a live show Sunday night. Shotgun had to work. This one, I don't know. There's no really excuse there. I have it all set up. He's supposed to be here. The other, the other one, we set up so it's like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm doing good. It's uh, this is the first game I'm not going to go, so I'm going to let you guys cover this one in, in Tempe. I'll be able to. I mean, uh, Tucson. I'll be at home. I can watch all the games, which is kind of cool. To be able to do but i will be going to utah we just booked that that should be uh that should be a fun one but this keely to me this is a huge game yeah. in the pac-12 south uh you know that you talk about clay Hilton likes to say hey you're winning the pac-12 is important you got to win the south i'm not sure if this is a year you need to go eight and one or even seven and two to win the south but you know you beating arizona on the road that's one of the teams that looks they're, they were kind of, I said they were butt before. They were pretty <laughs> terrible the first two games. They didn't look good against BYU or Houston, but both those teams look really good now. Um, and, you know, that, So I think you can give them a pass. And they were changing the offense more than I thought going forward. So it wasn't just taking what Rich Rod had. They were doing something with Noah Mazzoni. They're doing a lot of different stuff. And, and you can see Khalil Tate, like Keeley mentioned, is a different quarterback. But this is a team that I think is on the rise. They ran for over 400 yards against Oregon State, and their defense played a lot better. So I think they really, they really will be a threat in the Pac-12 South. So if you lose this game, that's a head-to-head -head battle with one of the you know top two or three teams in the South. I think that's going to be a, a really, you know, it, it'll be tough to overcome for Clay Helton. Now, maybe there's kind of carnage all over the place, but if you lose this game, Keely, I think you need carnage all over the place if you want to have a realistic chance of winning the South. Yeah, and that's what Clay Helton established to reporters after uh, practice on Tuesday, saying that Clay Helton's favorite phrase, if you get it done in Arizona, you continue to control your own destiny in the Pac-12 South. Uh, he said it's really important. Uh, they went undefeated in the Pac-12 South last season, and that's how they returned back to the Pac-12 Championship, and that's what he said that this team needs to do again to get back there. Uh, but given uh, Arizona's kind of shaky start in the beginning, they look a little better, bit better now, as you said. Do you think this is a potential trap game almost? Okay, so... This was a, one of my trap games going into the season. And then after the first two weeks, I was like, no, it's no longer a trap game. Um, and I, I don't think it's still a trap game because of the way, you know, start off one and two, I don't think you can overlook anybody. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought that Arizona was just going to be terrible. But they've they've played a lot better. We'll, we'll probably get into, you know, some of the specifics about that team a little bit going forward. I just did a podcast yesterday with Jason Shear, who publishes... Wildcat Authority, if you want to check that out on uscfootball.com, he does a lot of detail about, you know, going into this Arizona team. But I do think this is a team that's kind of on the rise. They're pretty thin at defense. They were really young last year. And, you know, USC should be able to move the ball on this defense. And if they don't, I mean, that's the – if it's the, well, USC isn't at home anymore, they're going to struggle on the road, that's the potential problem. So yeah. 
Uh, we'll see, I, but I, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily a trap game per se. That I thought it would be because I thought USC would be in a better place. Where USC is now is not in a great place, so I think you can't overlook anyone, especially a Pac-12 South foe that looks like they're playing better football now. Yeah. From what we saw with USC's offensive performance on Friday, do you take anything from that performance, or are you still unsure what USC team will see on Saturday? Um, no, I'm still unsure. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I think you could take something away from that. Like, that's, you know, that, there's some good signs and there's some not-so-good signs. Um but, you know, certainly a lot better than what you saw the two previous road games. I mean, it's a little concerning if you look at what USC was able to do on the very first drive of the game against Washington State. They rushed for 80 yards. For the rest of the game, they rushed for 86. So that's, you know, it's like, well, wh what's going on here? And uh, But, you know, seeing JT Daniels throwing the ball, and I, I know you guys interviewed uh, Brian Ellis, the, the quarterback coach, during the, you know, during the, the practice this week. It just seems like there's a lot of deep throws, which is great. You know, a true freshman quarterback is throwing the ball down the field. You got guys that can make catches that got a lot of calls. But it seems like this sort of feast or famine yeah. kind of offense, you know. And that's when they weren't getting any feasting. You, they weren't, you know, they weren't any big plays. And we've seen this for a couple of years with USC. It's like big plays are what makes the offense go, not not what you saw in the first drive, like the 80 yard. Uh, you know, that was on like six runs or something. But yeah, that I think there's still this reliance on athletes making big plays and if you, if you don't get it then uh, you know there's problems yeah and i think that's the difference between the stanford game texas game versus wazoo wazoo not as great as the defense as the prior two games but you also got some calls pac-12 refs you got a lot of pass interference calls some of them a little iffy but you got some help there where usc wasn't getting that help before a little bit more chemistry but a lot of it is just hero ball and it's <laughs> it, relying yeah. on usc's talent to just beat out a man and then there's touchdown the the screen pass to uh to michael pittman michael you know pittman, yeah. yeah so which was pretty but it was yeah, pretty but, that, that but was can you ball, do yeah. that consistently week in week out <laughs> we haven't seen that so i don't know if this is necessarily a turning point for usc's offense in that regard so this is this should be an opportunity on the road to to really do what you want to do on offense because it's not a yeah. great arizona defense now i i was impressed oregon state Put up a bunch of points on Ohio State on the road, you know. Arizona shut them down to 14 points at home. Um, and I, I think that they've seen, they've done some different things. Uh, you know, that whole staff got turned over, and I'm blanking on the defensive coordinator. Uh, Yates, I think Yates is the defensive coordinator. He's been there for three years, so he was kind of a holdover. He had a lot of those guys last year when they were young. And uh, I remember talking to Jason Shear heading into the season. They only had two healthy uh, scholarship cornerbacks on yeah. the whole team. Like, how are you going to go through the Pac-12? Well, they played a lot of dime coverage in that game against Oregon State. They did more things, and they, they tried some different stuff, uh, four down linemen, things that they hadn't seen before. So USC doesn't typically do well when, oh, we've never seen them do that before. I could see Marcel Yates doing that for Arizona, and they're playing more guys. Like, I think they kind of got you got comfortable with these are the guys that will play, um, but... I think they just felt like they needed to rotate more, and they've been doing that and had a lot of success on the road against Oregon State. Now, that's a different story. This is their first, you know, this will be their biggest test as far as trying to do that against athletes, but I think Arizona's going to come to play, and USC can't come in there with a C-plus game and, and squeak out a win. I, I think they're going to have to play pretty well, and away from home, we're just, we're just not sure. Yeah, and... and for Khalil Tate, this is a big game for him. I don't know if he would admit that, but he was crying after last <laughs> season's loss. I think it's a, you bring your best when you play USC. But as far as not knowing essentially what the defense might bring Arizona's, I feel like USC fans are a little uh, concerned because maybe this might be the, the game that Khalil Tate just decides he wants to run again. You know, and having that <laughs> containment on the edge has been a struggle for USC on defense so far this season. How do you think they fare with Khalil Tate? Do you think Khalil Tate suddenly goes, you know what, I want to win and I'm going to run? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. We had, so on the podcast with Jason Shear, I asked him about that. and We had a caller call in and say, I think it's more about Kevin Sumlin wanting to help him with his draft stock, just make him a drop back pass. Passer. And Jason, but you know, that might be a little bit of it, but he thinks a lot of it's on Khalil Tate. Like he just wants to be, you know, that's what he wants to do. But you said this is a very important game to him. And, I, and Jason said the same exact same thing. That's what this is the game that's going to mean the most for him because, you know, he's from, you know, Sarah High School, yeah. local, you know, Sonic uh, sort of got recruited by USC, but it wasn't really like, hey, come play quarterback like uh, Rich Rod was doing. So I think in that case, 
Yeah, I think it means a lot. And he's only rushed for 32 yards all year. So he, he did 300-something in one game last yeah. year when he was breaking out. So I could see him doing that, but it's really going to be the threat to run uh, that maybe he won't take off as much. But if you give him a crease, he'll take, he can do that. I think yeah. he might do that a little bit more, Keely, in this one. But J.J. Taylor is like a five foot five, like you're taller than him for sure. <laughs> five foot five back. It's powerful for a small back. He has almost 300 yards against Oregon State. Uh, they had two backs go over 100 yards. So I think USC is going to be focused on trying to stop the run. And then, you know, I think Tate's going to want to try to throw the football over the place. But if you don't keep the contain, if you, you know, get undisciplined in some of those rush lanes, I think you're right. I think this might be the game he kind of show, you know, spreads his wings. Yeah, remember I can run still? Yeah. Even though he's got a little bit of a bum ankle, I think you'll see maybe a little bit more of him running. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Do you want to get into questions, shall we? Yeah, we can. Do, should we? You want to talk about the turnover stuff, or do you oh want to yeah, do that? turnovers. We um, can do that. Uh, we can do that too, or we can. We can make some questions about it. If you just want to get into questions, we can. I have a question for you guys in the comments. Uh, it to me, it looks like we're a little jumpy on the internet. That just could be just our internet here. But if it's a little spotty, let me know, and I'll try and fix some things. Um, let's go to a question from Gregory, who says, "What's going on with Stephen Carr? Why isn't he getting more carries?" I mean, you could say the same thing about all three running backs, I think. But Stephen Carr is the five-star guy that yeah. everybody wants to, you know. And I, I think he's healthy. Uh, I think they brought him along, you know, sort of slow. It seems like, I don't know, do you feel he's healthy? Kid? I think he's a little... A little? He's not 100%. And Clay Helton said as much. He said that's why uh, we haven't... You They were progressing Stephen Carr. I think you saw on that long run that Stephen Carr had. I think last year he turns that into a touchdown. Yeah. This year he got caught. So I think that he's a little... Not 100%. He's lacking that burst a little bit. So, I don't know. I'm a little skeptical about how healthy he is. But. Uh, he seems fine. Like Yeah, yeah. For, but that's not limiting his carries. Right. And But I think there's legit reason. Like, I think that's true. Like, everything you said. So, yeah, I don't want him to go out there and get 25. You wouldn't want that. So, I think he's fine with the number of carries. I think they need to rush the ball more than what they were doing. I think they are relying on their quarterback, uh, uh, you know, freshman quarterback, to go out and make the hero plays that Keeley was talking about instead of doing more of what you saw in the first drive against Washington State. But Favai Malpea, he has uh, you know five touchdowns on the year. I think you could see more carries from him. And, yeah. and Augustin Ware, I mean, I like him a lot. Too. I know some people get down on him. He's a senior that people, uh, I don't know about him. But, I mean, you know, he had the 100-yard game to start uh, the season. I think, you know, if he gets into a rhythm, he can do a lot of good things too. But I think it's not like, well, take carries away from this guy, give him that one. It's To me, it's more about just giving this group uh, more carries, but there, you know, Vavai, you know, he's been, uh, I think he's been special when you see him out there doing yeah. stuff. And I think all three of them, to have those three, all, I think it's really good. But uh, yeah, I, I'd like to see more carries overall. Let this team be more of a, you don't have to be run first all the time, but I think this team could run. The, I know Dan Weber thinks, let JT Daniel throw it all over the place, and he's really good, but I just, I don't want to rely on the freshman, you know, for me, let these guys run the football more and give him some more confidence. Yeah. We, have, did you expect, Vavai to look this good in the season so far? I mean, he just always been impressive to me. Uh, but yeah, yeah he's, um, I mean, the fact that, that he's getting these, you know, real opportunities, I think it's showing something. It, he's a special talent, you know, and I, you guys got to talk to him uh, this week. But I don't know, have you shocked you at all or what you A seen? little bit. I thought he would kind of take the Aka Cedric Ware role yeah. um, where you kind of, you're in for a couple carries, but you never really get a chance to break out. And I've been surprised at how when he's gotten opportunities, he really has make, made the most of it. And granted, that's also determined on how the O-line does per play, yeah. which has been a little spotty this year, but I've been impressed for he, sure. And he gets opportunities like inside the five sometimes. So that's like, yeah. he, he can pick up those a couple extra touchdowns. Yeah, I think yeah. I, there was one where like Carr had a couple big runs. I think like maybe the first, maybe it was the first uh, um, touchdown of the that drive of the Washington State game. Yeah. Did he get the touchdown? He got the touchdown? Yeah, he did. Yeah, but like Carr had like a couple of the big carries. Yeah, which so. why not give it to Carr? <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll I mean, reward I, him for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he can be a little vulture at the end zone sometimes. Yeah, yeah okay. But. I'm going back to YouTube and Facebook. I'm giving YouTube some love. They feel a little neglected. Oh, uh, sorry. 1977 Trojan says, is our depth chart written in sand a la Pete Carroll or is it tablets of stone? Thoughts carved and stuff. No, um, it's not carved in stone, but it's they make decisions and they kind of stick with them. Um, the interesting thing is, if you had asked this last week, I would have said stone, but after Washington State, I'm a little leaning towards sand because we saw Almond Ra actually started the first drive 
Uh, Tyler Vons came in on the second drive, and then you saw Pali Ie Naotoote get uh, reps starting uh, in the beginning of the defense. He came off after a couple right. of plays, but, but because Porter Gusset, Gusset yeah, <laughs> at the same time, but at the same time, I would have expected maybe Hunter Eccles or uh, Juliana Falanico, sure, uh, older guys, more experienced maybe. So the fact they that love Pali Ie, they really yeah, do. Yeah, so yeah. seeing that, granted. USC did go to a three three five, so maybe that changes things a little bit. But I think it's a little bit less in stone. Yeah, as I like thought. Elijah Griffin, you know, maybe he gets the start there. Uh, I mean, but they, there's weird stuff. They I mean they listed Aka Cedric Ware as the starter for Washington State, and then he, you know, had one carry. Um, so there, you know, there's some kind of weird stuff going on. But if you're, I think some of the other positions where maybe you know, if people want someone replaced on the offensive line, we, there's a lot of bodies there. If you're underperforming, I, I'm not sure they're going to move dudes around in some of those spots. But I think there's some that they will. Uh, so it probably depends on the position group, too. Well, speaking of moving dudes around, Brandon says, has Elijah Griffin outperformed Greg Johnson for him to get first team reps yesterday? I mean, apparently, right? Like, uh, Yeah. So I actually talked to Elijah Griffin, and he said he wasn't expecting it at all yesterday. He was like, that was a curveball that the coaches uh, – gave to me and he said that uh, he doesn't know whether or not he's going to start come Saturday, but I think that's a product of poor play by Greg Johnson and Isaiah Langley. I think it's a little bit of the coaches being like, at this point, let's kind of try something new because Greg Johnson got a little picked on against Washington State. Yeah. So I think this is them trying to see if, if Elijah has gotten enough experience in the first four games to maybe uh, have some significant playing time come Saturday. Yeah, Kenneth had the same sort of question on Periscope, too. If I'm, sorry for looking down. I'm checking our Periscope feed. But yeah, it's yeah and, and that was a rotation, right? You had, you had Greg Johnson. You had Isaiah Langley in there. What this tells me is I think you're going to see uh, more of a rotation with Elijah Griffin in there, too. And maybe it's with Isaiah Langley or maybe it's with Greg Johnson. I'm not really sure. But that'll kind of tell you which, which way they're they're sort of leaning, but there's, you know, that one corner spot, they're playing around. I mean, you know, Jack Jones is gone, so you're, they're playing around a little bit. The other safety spot next to Tell, they've had to play around with that quite a bit. And not not because of performance, because of everything else, but, you know, you know three people basically being gone from that position. So, But they liked uh, Tell Noho Funga coming in there, and yeah. you get a five-star coming in. You want to give him an opportunity. Uh, you feel bad for, like, uh, C.J. Pollard if, if he was playing better. Do you want to play the freshman five-star kid like seems like it you know but I, whatever i mean he's i think he's performed really well uh all those guys would like to get their hands on a ball and secure it i think griffin talked about it with uh with you or, or chris trevino i think and uh, uh and hufunga talked to me about it after the game because he had that third down batted ball and he was like next time that happens i'm getting that ball in my hand so it's only something they want to improve on yeah and that's, that's funny i'm not I, i'm trying to get into the advanced stats kind of stuff a little bit more and uh, i'm my buddy David Woods, who you know he uh, writes for Bro, um, UCLA side, but we do our podcast of champions together. He's pretty good with that. Sent me uh, some metrics today that I'm going to look up stuff. But and I know Dan Weber brought this up. So USC is leading the nation in passes defended, and last in the nation interceptions because they have none. And I think Alabama's second, and they have seven interceptions. You know, like one or two pass deflections behind. So fumbles. It's basically if if you fumble the ball. They've, some of it's luck, but re whoever recovers, it's usually a 50-50 proposition. I think Arizona is really bad. They forced a bunch of fumbles, and they didn't re haven't recovered any or have only recovered one. But for tip passes, you should intercept a, a, a higher percentage of those just because now the pass is up in the air. It's been tipped. And USC hasn't gotten any of them. So that's something that you know they, they need to try to address to, to figure out because they're, they're not getting to the quarterback. Um, yeah. you know, they've had three sacks over the last three games, so that's one a game. That's not very good. Uh, and they led the nation in that last year. And then certainly the turnover margin, uh, four turnovers and only two four. So it's minus, you know, 0. 0.5 turnovers a game. So that's not where you want. I know Clay Hilton would love to get three turnovers per game. He's uh, 10 short of that heading into uh, game five. So uh, not quite where they want to be with the turnover stuff. And and that Washington State game, I think Keely and I talked about this on Sunday. There's no turnovers. One turnover by USC and they lose. So you got, I mean, just forcing one or two, it can be a huge deal. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, if, if they turn the ball over a couple of times against Arizona and Arizona doesn't, and Arizona's bad at, at, at with the turnover margin stuff too. Yeah. Whoever wins that turnover battle, that might, they might win the game. Uh, Daryl on YouTube says, is it possible that Clancy's aggressive defense has a lot to do with all the big plays given up by the opposing defense? 
I mean, when you have a, when you're aggressive, but I think there's been some. It's not like he's been. It's not like all out aggressive. It's not like what Todd Graham you were seeing from Arizona State a few years ago, where they just like blitzed everybody all the time. Uh, I mean, I think he's doing. He has a plan, and I think he's doing. He's tweaking things and trying to do different things, right? But he does. I think he puts a lot of pressure on the corners to uh, to make plays because he'll drive some stuff with the front uh, and and not really give as much help in the secondary sometimes. So, um, but you know. I, People have got on him a little bit. I kind of like, at least he has a plan going. It seems like there's a plan. It doesn't always work, but um, it, it seems like there's strategy behind it. And like him and Leach, uh, Shotgun talked about it too, like, you know, going at each other. He would blitz like Tal Noah and, you know, Leach would know and and, and, and Gardner Minshew would know, okay, the, the blitzer's coming from this side and here's my hot route or here's the, here's the guy that's going to have one-on-one -on -one coverage you know, where the gap is left and I'm going to go hit it. That's a really good offense, you know, more yeah. than anything. So I'm not as down on, on Clancy Pendergast as some. Um, I, I feel like there's an identity there on the defensive side where I don't feel as much on the offensive side. Yeah. Uh, Brandon says, do you see USC having a spy to watch Khalil Tate? And if so, do you have Mar Marvell slash Talanoa do it or do you have Cam Smith do it? That's a good question. I'm not sure. It doesn't seem like USC is much of a, a... This is a good shotgun question. Have we heard from him or no? But, <laughs> no. So he must have fell asleep. Well, someone asked, where is the film study? So shotgun and I did a film study last week that we posted on the Paracel for our VIP members. We did that last night. I ended up leaving at 3.30 in the morning. So he might be oversleeping because of our late night film study. So that might be a reason, but... Yeah. yeah. Um, so I still made it. That, I think that's a pretty good like shotgun question. Too. Wait, what was this one we were talking? Spine, oh, for the spine. spine. Yeah. I don't think they do that quite a lot, and because he's not been running as much, I feel like they're going to work on just contain, you know, general containment. Um, and I think they're going to try to. You might see more guys in the box, not necessarily as a spy on tape, but really to try to slow down this really potent Arizona rushing attack. It's it's a different looking team. Uh, than last year, and I so I think it's less going to be about spying Tate and more about trying to contain uh, everyone at the last scrimmage, any backs, uh, stop the run, and see what Tate can do. Now we've seen Tate last year. There were games where he ran, you know, ran for 300 yards, but then you know threw for over 300 and four or five touchdown passes. I think in the bowl game he did that too. So uh, this is a USC defense. You know, we just had a question about it, giving up some big plays. Uh, not necessarily in the run game. I mean, they could give up some big passing, uh, you know, plays here too. So I think that's my guess is it's going to be more about trying to contain him in the pocket and and stop the run and and see what he can do with his arm beating the beating the secondary. They didn't have a spy for Monty Rogers, right? I don't think they did. No, yeah. Look, I don't remember. I mean, there might have been a player too or something. But I don't remember that was some bit, sort of. But he, you know, he did run for over 100 yards. So. That's true. <laughs> uh, Brody Boy says, have such will they incorporate an entire series of plays as part of the Thor package? That's the package that you have either Brett Nealon or just DJ's, DJ's as 99 as like an H-back fullback type. Uh, so he says the Thor package so that there is an entire series of run and play action pass options in short yardage situations. Yeah, so I think some of the, the uh, outrage after the game, there's always outrage, right? Uh, <laughs> some of it was like, well, how is this package just being inserted this past week and all that kind of stuff? And so, here's the thing. In practice this week, T. Martin said that that's something they've had since fall camp. So maybe Clay was talking about like that specific play? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But that maybe, you know, but to be fair, Keely, like maybe they heard the outrage and they're like, hey, you can't say that. Maybe. Say, we weren't really trying to run the football until this past week. <laughs> we did see That's some... what people looked at it as. Like, oh, so you didn't want to run the football until this past week. You know? Yeah, we did see some revisionist history with said where's comments and what Clay said. So maybe it's another spin move. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's spin, whatever. But yeah. um, I, I think for something like that, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of it. There's going to be, it's going to be situational, like inside the five, uh, you know, trying to run out the four minute drill, like trying to run out the clock. Uh, is, is he much, I mean, he's a pretty athletic kid, like Brett Nealon out there, but is he going to be much of a threat to do uh, sort of anything else? And, you know, one of the plays he came in there, they got a holding call, I believe it was. So uh, that's the problem is like, remember, you know, against Texas, they ran under center twice. Um, inside the five, and both times they got uh, penalties. So when you don't do this stuff very often, I think you're right. Like if you're going to try to make this a part of it, you got to see it more in practice. You got to yeah. you know do it all the time because you, you, you're going to have a, like if uh, if Shaka was here and he charted all the you know the Thor packages or or the under center ones, like there'd be a high percentage of them that you got a penalty on because I know there was at least one in the Washington State game and the only two under center 
for uh, Texas, you got a penalty on. So if you're going to like not line up right, and uh, it's going to because you don't use this formation very often, that's going to be counter, you know, productive. So yeah. uh, I think they need to use it more in practice. We'll see. Uh, did you? I don't. Can we say? If we, we, can't saw really, I, we can't really yeah. say if we saw anything. I didn't really. I I speaking specifically of last week because that's in the past. In the past. I didn't really see it last week. Did no. you? No, yeah, I so I don't. Maybe that was like a Thursday thing. Not sure. Yeah, so they we, we can't see Thursday practices. So, yeah, they're close. Uh, maybe that's where all the but there's no pads then. So do you really want to practice bringing in a 295 pound? Is that what he weighs? He's like 295 or something. You uh, think? Neilan. Neilan? Yes, I think so. Something like that. Yeah, I don't think he's quite three bills, but like, is that what you want to practice? Like your your Thor package on a Thursday where there's no you know no pads at all? Like probably not. But. Yeah. Not sure. Ricky says, what's our biggest concern this season? Biggest concern? You can um, take that a lot of different I ways. I mean, <laughs> like it depends. I'm so, there's a lot of USC fans that are concerned that USC might win too many games and Clay Hilton <laughs> remains the head coach. I've seen that. Uh, certainly, I mean, your biggest concern, you want to try to you know win the Pac-12 again and, and starting off with a Pac-12 loss uh, doesn't make it easy. You almost have to run the table. Uh, I think seven and two in the Pac-12 this year will probably get it done in the South. Uh, it depends how things uh, go down, but you know, do you want to get into a six and three with a three-way tiebreaker sort of thing? Those um, are always gross. I mean, I think really trying to uh, win the South, and then I mean, the biggest card I think you just really want to get better as a team. Um, I, I don't look at freshman quarterbacks as an excuse. I think there's veteran groups that aren't pre playing very well, and you yeah. want to. Have everyone come together and play as a team because they're still the most talented team in the Pac-12. If you can somehow win the South, you can easily beat you know, do see beat Stanford before. You can do beat them again. They look really yeah. good this year. They held USC to three points, but that's a team that USC can beat. So Washington's a team USC can beat. Uh, you know, Oregon's a team USC can beat. They can't. So just kind of getting there, but you progress and play well. And and I think if you see this team playing well, maybe some of the people will forget about. The, you know, two terrible losses that started the season. Yeah, I think USC's biggest concern is their O-line. I think it's just such a crux of the offense, and they're so inconsistent that it makes T. Martin's job harder because you don't know what's going to break down. You don't know when this is going to work. You don't know which player is going to have a bust in, in coverage or something like that. So you, it's it makes everything harder, and once the offense starts to get a little stagnant, Everyone gets in their minds a little bit. Yeah. You see what you saw against Stanford and, and Texas. So I think that's their biggest concern. Yeah, of like deficiencies or whatever. Yeah, I would totally agree. Yeah. I think. And that's where you should have the least concern, right? Like you, you should. Yeah. Should, in I mean, theory. In theory, with all the returning experience, I mean, experience. how many minutes are back, you know, starting and, and playing time, you know, from that group? Like a lot of playing time from those guys. And there's 15 of them, you know? Yeah. Uh, 15 scholarship offensive linemen. Like, there's a lot. Yeah. Um, and they've all been in the same system for three years. So uh, th there should be less excuses. If if they're not performing well, uh, there, there's something being done wrong. Yeah. Well, that's Team Use the Great on YouTube says, why is Andrew Voorhees so inconsistent? I don't know. Why are <laughs> people humans and imperfect? It's, <laughs> it's a I mean, that's one of those cases where if you feel like um, – he's not performing well and you could put somebody else in for a little while, you do it, you know, and uh, I th we've seen some, some of that, but it, it might be, you know, they set Tyler Vaughn's, you know, just, and it's like, yeah, I know he wasn't performing at the high level, but um, as, as you would expect, but I think a lot of it was, it wasn't just him. It was, you know, the chemistry between Daniels and Vaughn's and Daniels and Pittman. It just wasn't there. We saw it a lot better yeah. uh, in the Washington State game. Maybe you need to sit him down and not have him start a game or something or whoever. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to call out him specifically, but if you're, you know, you got to watch the. It's hard to for us to be here at the high level and say, oh, this offensive line was crap or this whatever, just because you see him give up a sack or something or yeah. or get blown up on a play. You really have to be in the film. And if they're grading people out and one of the guards or whoever it is isn't doing that well. That's when you have to have the, you know, hey, you know what? Like, I, you're, you know, I think you're our best right guard or whatever it is. But uh, we're starting this guy because you just haven't been performing that well. And you can, you know, and work your way back into the rotation and figure it out. You know, I, I'm not sure they're doing that as much as you would like for as much as they're underperforming. There's just been some, and, you know, some of it, it's hard to tell when you, you see two offensive linemen 
not blocking anybody. And, you know, it, did they do the wrong things or did one of their teammates pick up the wrong mm -hmm. guy and they left him with nobody? You know, there's, yeah. there's all that kind of stuff going on too. Yep. Um, in that same, oh, what I was going to say is we might actually see more of Elijah Vera Tucker on Saturday because uh, Andrew Orhees has been really limited at practice this week with a sternum bruise, which is an odd injury. But uh, yeah, so that's a little, he's been limited. He has been doing scout team stuff, but not full contact. So I wonder if that's going to play into the game on Saturday. Not exactly sure. Well, we've seen guys not practice and still play. That's the other problem too. It's like you you are that deep. If a guy didn't practice all week. He doesn't start, you know, but put someone else in. I don't yeah. care if he's been there for three years or, you know, just, I, I think that's a, the message you want to send. And it motivates the, the other players too. Like, hey, you know, I've been getting first team reps all week. Yeah. The other guy hasn't played at all. And then you don't play, you know. Yeah. But Barry Tucker, I think he's been a, you know, a bright spot. We're not seeing as much of, of some of the backups like we saw against UNLV. I think the rotation has gone down significantly, right, since then. But uh, yeah. he's someone when he came in, I think he's, he's played pretty well. Yeah. And that's the thing. I don't think USC has that cutthroat ability where you're scared that you're going to lose your spot if you don't do yeah. something right. You know, it can so be motivate. You know, like maybe if, do that. I yeah. mean, the interesting thing is that uh, Michael Pittman said uh, when asked after the set first drive when USC came out and played super well, what happened on the second drive, and he said, "Oh, sometimes if we score that easy, we get a little complacent." And it's like. <laughs> what? <laughs> so we need. So we're going to take applications for our shotgun replacements. So I'm like, to, if you're watching right now, I, yeah, I'm. I'm <laughs> trying to resize the frame so you're more in it. So. Oh, sorry. You're no, don't move. Don't move. I just reframed it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, we have a question from Marcos who says, "What is the over under on how many more targeting penalties Porter Gustin will get this season? How does he c commit such an egregious, although missed by the refs and Larry Scott, target targeting play after being suspended in the first half for the exact same thing?" All right. So I've never uh, put pads on and tried to like run at a quarterback who's moving around or throwing or getting hit. Or I mean. I, to me, that seems like an extremely hard thing to do. And I, you know, if the helmets touch, sometimes it's the guy just, you know, completely jumping at at the, you know, the the ball carrier or the quarterback who isn't moving, and it's boom, and and it's like, yeah, that looks like that's what he was trying to do. And other times, it's like the guy, you know, the the running back or whatever ducks his head down, and you're yeah. already down. I mean, that's such a hard thing to police. It looked very much like targeting uh, on on Porter Gustin more so than what you called him for in you know, in the Texas game. I know people talked about when JT Daniels took a knee on that bad snap and then he got hit in the head too. Yeah, um, I didn't have a problem with that not being targeted. It seemed like the guy was, you know, the defender was like, "This is kind of weird." It was like this weird situation. You feel bad because like you're you're doing you're going 100 miles an hour and then if something happens you have to make sure you stop and stop doing what you've been trying to do for the last five seconds or whatever. Uh, I get it. Uh, I, I'm sure you get a pass on this one for Porter Augustine because he didn't get the call and, and like you mentioned, Larry Scott came out and said that they reviewed it and it wasn't targeting, which seems like stupid. You know, <laughs> yeah. that was targeting. You know, so like. Um, I don't know. I mean, he was out for the first half of the game, so maybe you're like amped up to come in the second half. I'm not really sure. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't think he'd get much more than you know. I'd put the over under at like one targeting call the rest of the year. But you know, if if another one happens or another near one happens again, I mean, that's something that the coaches would you know would have to address with them. But you get like two of those in a row, and now he's like, oh, he's this headhunter guy, um, yeah. Which you know, I don't think is necessarily fair. Yeah. The interesting thing that was uh, Porter Gerson was very limited in practice this week uh, because of a sore knee that was sort of precautionary. So I'm curious if you're trying to fix the way you tackle uh, and you're not really tackling at all, do you revert to your old ways? I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, he might get some opportunities against uh, Khalil Tate. And that, you know, that's part of it, too, is they haven't been getting to the quarterback as much. So you kind of get excited when you get there. Um, and that, you know, that call might have or non-call might have let USC win the game because otherwise that's a first down and uh, you're not talking about blocking a game, you know, game tying field goal. You're talking about potentially going in uh, for a touchdown. And who knows? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that hit may have, uh, you know, rung Connor, you know, his bell and uh, the quarterbacks and just, he wasn't able to you know be as effective after that. So who knows? I don't know. Just, yeah. That's an interesting theory there. Yeah. Trojan Simi says, do you agree that if USC wins on the O and D lines, USC wins dominantly? Yeah, I think so. This is like a three and a half point spread. And USC hasn't covered a single spread all year. So they're 0 and 4. And 5, 15 and 1 going back two years. So it's, uh, 
USC's not been, you look at the spread that's like playing up to what people expect. Um, I think if you get some dominant play on both lines, yeah, I think this would be a blowout. I think yeah. the, the way it's not a blowout is if you don't. And, and it's, uh, you, you struggle to block some of the guys. You're, you know, you're, you're getting JT Daniel sacked. You're not able to run the ball effectively. And you don't contain uh, not just Khalil Tate, but the, the running game of, of Arizona. So I think the, the running game for Arizona is the, you know, the key factor here. So, yeah, I think they're going to need – if you get dominant play from both lines, I, you know, USC has enough talent everywhere else that they'll, they'll win the game convincingly. Yeah. Demario says, Jaina Harris, does he need to be replaced? Science, size and speed is a problem with him. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I mean, he may, we've seen him make a lot of plays in practice. Uh, yeah. He's definitely made some plays there. But, you know, he's he's got burned a couple times, uh, too. So, I don't know. There's, they're already really rotating one cornerback spot and one safety spot. He's, you know, he's pretty reliable there. I don't see them making any sort of change. And I haven't seen anything, like, when I go back and watch the games that I'm like, man, Harris is just a, a liability. I, I haven't seen that. Um, I mean... A you know, little bit against little Texas, bit. that was definitely a liability. I wonder if it's worth just seeing what Jonathan Lockett can do a little bit. We haven't seen him a lot, and that was That's a guy true. who was starting before Ajene came on the scene. So I don't know. Is it this one of those things where Clancy just has his trust? And if you're, like you said, dealing with Isaiah Langley, Greg Johnson, and Hufunga, those are really new guys. Do you need Ajene there to kind of have that veteran presence a little bit? Not yeah. sure. No, I think that's a really good point, Keely, because uh, I like Jonathan Locker coming in. I thought they might find a spot for him yeah. and and really be a big part of this defense, and he hasn't been. Um, and if there is a game, you know, in Texas, there were some deficiencies for Jenny Harris. Hey, you know, give him a, give him an opportunity and play some more. And, I, and they're both, you know, it's like they're both seniors, but, you know, obviously Harris has been starting, and that's the people, that's the guy that uh, Clancy Pendergast trusts. But that would be another one of those opportunities where, like, I think he's trying really hard, and he's you know, and he's had some really good games. There was you know, uh, we talked about the the struggles at Texas, but you give a, a lock you know lock at a chance to go in there, and who knows, maybe he makes a big play, maybe he gets that interception that everyone else has been trying to get, and then you know you figure out something to do with him going forward. The thing I'm curious about is that in practice, uh, leading up to Wazoo, we saw USC use dime a lot and use Jonathan Lockett. We didn't see that. He Clancy usually likes to use dime against Leach, but we didn't really see that. So I'm curious what changed in philosophy. Not sure. Maybe it's a short week. I know talking to Talano Hufunga, he said that the coaches didn't get as good of a scouting report yeah. um, because of that. So not really sure. We've gotten a lot of questions about Aka Cedric Ware. Oh. Is, is Aka Cedric Ware in the doghouse? Is he out of the doghouse yet? Will we see him playing more? What do you think? I don't know if there might be a little doghouseiness to it, you know, with his comments. <laughs> Houseiness. Um, uh, you know, they, it's, because he had, what was his tweet? He had some sort of tweet or something that was like. Something about like they're sleeping on him. Like, yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I, when I put that story out that I thought he'd be a breakout player for USC, there, there was a lot of hate. Like people were like tweeting at him. Like, no, like, like they didn't want to see him. You know, they, they didn't want to see him be very. Successful, so he's one of those dudes that's super nice. And you, you, you know, you're gonna root for him. Um, you know, we didn't know that he was banged up going into the Washington State game. Uh, yeah. So we'll see. You know, going forward, uh, you know, at Arizona, what the rotation's like. Is he healthy? Does he get some carries? Does he only get a couple carries? Is he starting? Like they announce him as a starter, or is it Carr or yeah or Vi? You know, um, I'm not sure. Uh, that's that's a little weird one for me. Sometimes the, the younger five-star player is going to, you know, take over. But there's a lot of people that think he should, you know, Carr should get even more carries. I, I just feel like they could all, you know, you can share things around. But we had Max Brown come in here and say, you know, you don't get it. I think he said it. Like, you don't get into a rhythm. Yeah. You'd like to see, you know, one or two guys. They did that. They did two guys in uh, Washington State. And, it, you know, they had really good success for one drive. And then it was pretty, like, you know, eh, kind of the rest of the way. Yeah, that's the thing. I feel like there's a little bit revisionist history with Clay about how injured Akacetric Ware was because he didn't really say it leading up to Wazoo. Maybe that's just so you don't tell your opponent how injured someone is. Yeah. We did see he said a little limited, um, but Clay was asked about it yesterday, and he said, yeah, he said was pretty injured all week leading up to Wazoo. He said this is a must-win game against Wazoo, and thus I had to lean more on uh, Vavai and Carr. To me, I, I don't know. It's a little, it's a little odd, but I don't. Can you really see Clay punishing someone like that for uh, comments? It's, 
It would have. It wouldn't be like outwardly punished, but you know, maybe it's a thing where they feel like he didn't want you know uh, Washington State to prepare, or they wanted him to prepare for All where right. and you know, and he wasn't going to play. You know, maybe that's just some game, gamesmanship or something. It's hard to say, but I don't. I don't think he would do that. And I'm not sure how much you know he has. You know, I mean, he has the final say, but like, is it Tim Drevno? Like, is he one, the one making the rotation? I know when Dylan McCullough was around. Um, you know, there it seemed like he was controlling a lot of that. I'm not sure because you know Drevno hasn't really coached running backs a lot. Yeah. It, does Steve Martin have more of a say? Is it Clay Helton? It's hard to say how that works. Yeah. Um, Jacob Hutching says, "Do you think USC is a good offensive coordinator away from being a championship team?" No, I'm not going to put put all that on T on T Martin. No, I mean, I, it's not like if you brought in an offensive coordinator and they ran the same offense that's here, like you would have like. I think you would improve the team by hiring an offensive coordinator that comes from like a proven whatever it is. I don't, you know, there's a lot of people want I formation and pro, like that's fine. You get it, one of those guys, but someone that comes from his own, that some, from some guru tree of of offense. I think I think what the offense you have here is this hodgepodge of well, when Sark came and and like Kiffin and Sark didn't really have like this. They didn't come from some spread guru. That was just like the the end thing, and they all were starting to do it. But no one, you know, who really taught those guys the, the concepts of this the spread offense. They didn't come from like a, a Art Briles or any sort of, yeah. you know, Mike Leach. You see those guys that are like innovators. Chip Kelly did that stuff too, uh, and then people come off of that tree and they learn from them and and they go on to do it. Like no one, no guru taught those guys this, and Clay Hilton kind of learned from them. So to me, it's more of like a hodgepodge offense. So if you hired someone that you know that could run their own thing and it wasn't going to be an adaption of whatever USC is running now. Yeah. I think you would improve the team a lot. I don't know about championship caliber, but I think that would be a significant improvement, but I'm not going to throw like T Martin under the bus. Well, this is his fault or whatever. It's like, you know, it's, I'm not sure where this really came from. And I think that's why you bring in someone that's been, you know, experienced play caller that comes from, uh, you know, some, some, like I said, some guru, and this is what their philosophy is. And that's what you run. I just think what they're running is like all the leftover Sark Kiffin stuff that never that was just kind of created because that was the cool thing to do. <laughs> Not oh yeah, we you know, we learned this from the, the guy on top of the mountain. Like I don't think they learned it from anybody. You yeah. know, I think it was just like, oh, we look it up on the internet, like, yeah, that's what everyone's doing. Let's do that. <laughs> and that and the problem is with spread teams, that's the point, like you're supposed to run that to compete with like Alabama because we don't have as good as athletes at whatever our team is. So, but if we spread everything out, we can kind of even the playing field. At USC, you don't really need to do that because you don't have to spread everything out. You don't have to even the playing field because you have better players than the other team. So, I get the people saying, I'd rather not run that stuff. It totally makes sense. I think it would work if you ran it and it was like really well orchestrated. I don't think it's well orchestrated now. In that same sense, Daryl says, do you think USC's offense is too predictable? I don't know about the predictable. It's, I don't think it's that predictable. I think it's... I mean, maybe like when you come up there, you kind of defenses kind of know what's coming, but it's it's too grab baggy to me. It's not flowing. It's gumbo. Not, yeah, it's gumbo. And, and when Dan Weber said that's what like T Martin called it or something, and I was like, what? I thought you coined that phrase. It was gumbo. <laughs> it's just you know, it's eighty yard touchdown run, all runs, and then you know, throw it passes for the next two drives. Like there's. It's just, it's, it doesn't seem to flow really well. And I'm not, and like I said, I'm not putting that all on T. Martin or whatever, but it seems just like the, it's just this hodgepodge as opposed to defined identity, you know, uh, offense that has a, a, a distinct identity. Yeah. And so what I said on the podcast is you and Dan, if you, if someone has never seen USC football and you had to describe what USC's offense is, what would you say? <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, throw the ball deep. And you you hope sometimes. some running plays work, and you kind of choke it up there a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't like I don't know how you. I'm sure it. they love like if the you know coaches watch or whatever. They yeah, love yeah sorry. I'm about not that. trying to throw anyone. That's true. In the sorry, bus. I'm not trying to be rude. No, there. no, yeah, <laughs> but it's yeah. I don't. I just don't think where it came from. Like with the origin of the playbook it was some. You know, you want it to come from someone that's this. You know, high power that's done so many great things. And we, we that's not where this offense came from. Well, I, I just don't think balance is an identity either. Yes. Which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> right. Brandon says, where do you see uh, in Arizona's defense that USC can exploit? 
Well, um, it certainly should be the secondary. I, now, they've moved some guys around and, uh, I, you know, trying to make things work. But stopping an Oregon State passing attack is going to be a lot different than stopping a USC passing attack. So I think you're going to see some similar stuff to uh, some of the fronts that USC faces. Uh, Colin Schooler, like, he's their best player by far, the linebacker. I think they're pretty good at the linebacker spot. Um, you know, they're doing some different things at the front. I think they can confuse the USC offensive line because we've seen that time and time again. They'll do something that wasn't on film and they'll have some guys break free. It doesn't matter how big or strong, but they're going to just scheme wise. I think they're going to do some pretty good things up front, but the secondary is going to be tougher for, you know, it's if they can, you know, shut down USC's passing attack, that's going to be a big problem. I think that's where the biggest uh, advantage for USC is going to be. You got Pittman, you got Vaughn's, you got Amon Ross St. Brown and Daniel's throwing the football. Um, I think that's where you can kind of exploit them uh, the most. They've moved pieces, it, they've played better, but they haven't seen the kind of athletes that USC has out there. So I don't, I don't see them being able to to stop that. I think they'll have more success kind of slowing down the run, uh, and then it's just going to be up on the, the USC defensive side to to try to slow down that passing game. But you might see. You know, not as many possessions in this game. You might see Arizona grinding it out at home, just trying to keep USC off the field. And if they can get a turnover, you know, tip a pass, do something, get a few stops, that's going to be to Arizona's advantage. So I think USC has to keep, you know, hitting them through the air. If they can run the ball, that's great. Um, but I think if they can, you know, exploit that secondary, I think that it'll help USC a lot. We have a question from Trek Ranger who says, what's up with all the uh, conversions on third and long? And what have they done to address it, if at all? Yeah, uh, I'll let you talk about the addressing part. But so basically what USC's defense, and, and this is another advanced stat sort of thing, but um, not, it might, maybe not super advanced stat, but USC's first and second down defense has actually been pretty good uh, because they're forcing you know third and longs, third and 8.2 or something like that yard. So defense on the first two, uh, dry, the first two downs have been, has been great or, you know, comparatively you know, really good in the country and then really bad on third down. So that's the ironic part is that you force the third and longs, which typically are harder to convert. And then USC's conversion there in like the hundreds or something of being able to stop on third down. So that's a real big uh, issue. And I'm not sure if it's, you know, just the play calling or how aggressive you are in first and second down and you back off a little bit on third down. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it's certainly something that that needs to be addressed. I, I think Clancy talked about it a little bit too. He did. I wasn't in Clancy's scrum, so yeah. I, I wasn't fully sure. But I think the, the the thinking with a lot of the defensive coaches, I don't think they're throw everything out because nothing's working. I think they just are, hey, there's some young players, there's some deficiencies, but we overall believe in what we're doing. And over the course of the season, it will get better as we progress. So I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's one of those things, you know, listen to what, Clancy, I think uh, Chris Trevino or, or Shotgun was in the... the uh, Chris was, yeah. Yeah, the, the Clancy sort of scrum. And um, that's a that's an odd one. Like, you don't know, you know, typically if you're a team that gives up a lot on third down, it's because, uh, I mean, Oregon was great at this back with Chip. I mean, they would get eight yards on first down. Now they're second and two. Spread you out all over the place. Like, you're screwed, you know? Yeah. Uh, but USC has been really good and forced these third and longs. So that's what's, I think, the most frustrating for, for USC fans. they got to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, Hugo says, is Clay Helton just clueless that we need the players to practice more with pads? What is he thinking? And there's a lot of question marks. A lot. A lot. Of, well, yeah. we better take it seriously. So many <laughs> question marks. Um, no, I don't think Clay Helton is clueless. I think he has a philosophy. And where did this philosophy come from? He was under, at USC, Lane Kiffin and Steve Sarkeesian. And with Lane Kiffin, it was during the sanction era. So I think there's this hangover of the sanction era now where the most concerning thing was keeping people healthy. And that was, you, and, and give it, you had, you had to do that. If you're Lane Kiffin, you had to back off on some of this stuff. But I don't think you need to do that anymore. And I think that's just, that's where he learned um, uh, at USC. And that was the philosophy. And he's not really changing that philosophy. I'm not sure what it would take for him to change the philosophy because I think you know losing would you know could potentially change that but I don't know at this point if he's going to lose a bunch I don't think he gets he's not going to have really a bunch of opportunities to fix that yeah. and change it uh, but that's I feel like just coming from the you know 2010 2011 like the sanction years under Kiffin 
That's the way you kind of had to do things. I don't think you have to do that now. Um, now, not every school does it. I think Clemson practices very similar to the way USC does as far as days and pads. I'm not sure if they do like, you know, Tuesdays full pads and they're tackling like USC isn't doing that. But as far as number of days and pads, Clemson's similar. But a bunch of the other schools, not so much like, you know, Georgia and, and Alabama, you know, they're all closed. But the people I talk to are like, yeah, I think at least two or three days in full pads. So other than those big programs, Ohio State did the same thing. Uh, for the Cotton Bowl, but by the time USC landed, Ohio State already had two full pads practice, and, and USC That's I don't crazy. think did any. So yeah, so there's it's definitely there's different ways to do it. There's different philosophies. Dabo Sweeney's very you know uh, successful, and his his uh, you know philosophy is a little closer to Clay Helton. So yeah, we did see the return of full pads on Tuesday, which is which is positive in that regard. We also saw more tackling drills both on. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, we saw more DBs do some some. They move some dummies and they they tackle them. Um, and then we saw on Wednesday they used to do this in fall camp, but it was like half a special teams drill, half just a tackling drill where they put two guys at the side and it's kind of you have to make an open field tackle. And that's something that we haven't seen in a while. So it's interesting that they're bringing that back, especially because you saw some some tackling breakdowns on the defense. A lot of the DBs are tackling really high or trying to get their arms to tackle an open field, which does not work. And I think that's why you see some of the breakdowns because against Washington State, USC wanted to force everything underneath, and right. they got that. But then the guy who was closest to, couldn't make that play and couldn't make the tackle. So you're doing everything schematically right, but physically you're not tackling where you, when you need to tackle. So I think it's at least good that they brought back some of the tackling drills because you start to see that breakdown when you go no pads like that. When, I don't know if you saw So it seemed to me early on in Washington State that um, it, it seemed more scheme-wise. You know Washington State likes to run the short stuff, the screens, and USC did it well. And I don't think it's necessarily a one-on-one -on -one guy making a tackle. It was more about you had multiple players there. You were shutting that down. Yeah. But once they spread it out a little bit more, then you put some USC guys in space, and that's where they seem to have some of the tackling problems. And that intermediate passing game, I, you know, Gardner Mitchie was great. I mean, yeah, he was like no. a surgeon. Yeah. But then guys would make plays afterwards a lot of times. Yeah, it seemed like... I know we talked about it, but Greg Johnson had just problems. He the wide receivers would get a lot of separation on Greg Johnson, which is a problem. And then, but you did see on the the screen plays out to the flats, like right at the line of scrimmage. Wazoo didn't really do that a lot, and when they did, guys like uh, Talano Hufunga and Iman Marshall shut that down quick. But like you said, the intermediate stuff, that's where it kind of the tackling got a problem because they did want to force everything underneath, but they just couldn't make some of the tackles there, and thus you get a first down and it doesn't work out yeah. how you want. Hey, before. Before I forget, everybody, if you're on Twitter and stuff, make sure you tweet at Shotgun SPR <laughs> and say, hey, man, where were you today? Just give him lots of crap on Twitter. You know, he, yep. uh, he, I know he's working hard and he must have slept there. He, he sets like eight alarms. I think he slept through them all. But make sure you tweet at him, at Shotgun SPR. Tell him, hey, man. We're Ryan and Keeley are there. Where are you at? Yeah. Um, I set an hour of alarms at 8 a.m. and just kept hitting Did snooze. You? Yeah. I know my, my body and I need I need an hour of wake up. Uh, we have a question from Thanos, a Marvel fan, I guess. Does Isaac Ta Taylor Stewart play? Now, this is something that's intriguing to me because okay. Isaac Stewart does play, but on special teams. Right. Now, he's played in all four games so far this season. Do you take Isaac Stewart out and redshirt him this year? Or, I mean, he's not getting any time on actual defense, do you keep, but right. do you continue to have him play on special teams? That's, I'm not sure. Yeah, so if, one of the craziest things that's happening with this redshirt rule, and this is, you know, whenever people want to, like, they, like something's going wrong and you want to make a law or a rule or you're trying to fix it, sometimes it works, but a lot of times you have unintended consequences where it does maybe even does the exact opposite of what you're doing. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but that redshirt rule, I think there's at least a dozen players that after four games, they decided, you know what, I'm not getting enough playing time. I think Oklahoma State's like best wide receiver is transferring out of the program. Uh, you're seeing Kelly Bryant at Clemson, who uh, won all these games, and, and you got Taylor uh, Trevor Lawrence coming in and, and winning the job. He's transferring out. There's a lot of that happening across the country. Weirdly, it hasn't really happened at USC. If you figure something like that would happen. Yeah. Um, but I think for someone like that, I don't think you would play him for the first four games of special teams and then not play him again. Uh, I, I, I just feel like it wasn't going to be a special teams audition. Like if they wanted him to try, you know, I don't know what the point would be. If you're playing him on special teams, you just want him to be there. You don't expect him to play uh, on defense. He hasn't been as advanced and, and as far up the ladder as 
Elijah Griffin had both of those, you know, highly ranked cornerbacks coming in. So my guess, Keely, is he's going to keep playing the way he's been playing. Is there anything weird with the the four game redshirt rule that, that's going on with this team now that you've seen? I, it doesn't seem like there's any like, well, I'm out, I'm transferring. Like maybe, you know, it's like Jack Sears would have said, oh, I'm going to leave now, but he wasn't playing her anyway. You know, so yeah, no, I don't think we've seen any of that specifically at USC. Clay Helton did say that he did sit down with his staff this week and looked at basically he said what shotgun does they have someone on the staff who charts every play that every player has played so far so clay helton knows okay who's played in two games who's played in three who plays in four who's on that redshirt balance who's not yeah. um so he says he's they've already made up who will redshirt this season who will not when asked about it he said i can't list off everyone because i have 110 players <laughs> so yeah. we didn't get a lot of info there uh but i have heard that a lot of the the star incoming freshmen have been told uh, they, they're they not going to redshirt. I know Elijah Griffin, I asked him, he's like, I'm not redshirting. I was like, okay, yeah. I just had to ask. But uh, so I, I don't really see guys like that redshirting. So. Yeah, I'm pretty sure JT Daniels is not going to redshirt. I think they're gonna Interesting. Play. Yeah, <laughs> breaking news. That was something when USC was <laughs> losing to Washington State, I was standing next to Shotgun on the sideline, and I was like, here's a conspiracy theory. What if you just redshirt JT Daniels? Like if they lose and oh. they you just tank the season, redshirt JT Daniels. <laughs> I don't think they would ever do that, but no, it's, it's a fun like the, thought experiment. He though. would just, leave, I mean, yeah, he, no, that <laughs> would not, because he's not, he, it doesn't matter, he red shirts this year, he's going to leave after three anyway. So. Yeah, I know, it was just a dumb joke. Uh, Amon Ross and Brown? No, he's no. not going to red shirt. Demario says, do you think USC is better than Utah? Um, I think defensively Utah is better right now, and I think offensively USC is better. Uh, USC has to play that game uh, in Salt Lake City, though, so it's uh, it's going to be a different story. Yeah. It's going to depend to me how if they can get that offense going. I like Tyler Huntley a lot. Um, they, you know, they that's a program that would they change their offensive coordinator every year. This is the second year for Troy Taylor. Maybe they need to change it again. I don't know, but um, they've been underperforming on the offensive side of the ball. But they're going to be better than USC in special teams, even though they've had some. It's been a little shaky in some of the the games that they've had. That's just something they, they focus on and emphasize. And then, uh, you know, I think they're a really, really good defensive team. The way this USC offense is run, uh, you know, we'll see what they do against Arizona on the road. But yeah. playing a tough defense on the road could be a big problem. Uh, so getting that, you know, USC offense machine rolling and having the defense play well against a struggling offense, uh, we'll see. But I don't know. I, they're probably pretty close. It's The South is pretty wide open right now but because that game's played in utah i'm going to give advantage of utah on this one at least from what i've seen so far yeah usc has always had trouble once they go to utah and this is a team that we've seen is a little mentally uh not as tough it's a young team that if if the momentum starts to swing a certain direction when they're on the road it's really hard for them to get the sideline going again to get them to believe hey we can we can turn this around um, we had a comment from Jared. He said, this is dope. Thanks, Jared, on Thanks, Jared. Uh, Periscope. And then uh, Otis Page, do you fear that USC will become the Josh Rosen version of UCLA? Hmm, that, I don't know what, what that's... What does that mean? <laughs> the Josh version... Josh uh, Rosen version of well, UCLA? Well, you have like, this great quarterback, oh, okay. but not really a lot of success on the... Um, I mean, there's that potential there. Like every quarterback for the last 20 years at USC has been drafted, right? Like they've, they, yeah. you've never known what it's like to have uh, a quarter, you know, Michigan had like Wilton Spade who actually is at UCLA now or whatever, you, you know, yeah. LSU for years would have talent all over the place and they couldn't get an NFL level quarterback. USC's always had an NFL level quarterback for as long as you can remember, most likely. And, uh, it doesn't always, it doesn't always work. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I there's, saw this on Twitter. Someone said it's an outrage that if you think about it, USC had Sam Darnold, Ronald Jones, and Deontay Burnett and did not reach the playoffs. So do you, do you think that? It's a weird thought. I mean, like under, talent I think there was an underutilization of yeah. talent. Yeah, I think that the levels that of, of guys that USC had. And Dory Jackson, Juju like, Smith-Schuster. Yeah, like those two dudes are like ridiculously yeah. good. You know, those were signing day specials, you know, yeah. and uh, for Sark coming in there. There's just so many five-star guys coming through. Not everyone works out. There's some busts. But I think the level of talent coming in, I think Dan Weber likes to talk about this. If you 
just the recruiting rankings, which I get, don't mean everything, but they they mean a lot. They show you a lot of what's going on there. There's you know there's you you Chenu and Wusus of the world that are three star dudes that come in and, and they're in the NFL now. Like you yeah. develop them, that's good. That's that's good on the coaches, good on the players. You identified someone that had a higher ceiling. You brought him to that level, and he's doing good things now. But there's only a few teams in the country that can recruit at the USC level, like Alabama and Georgia and Ohio State and Clemson, and you're seeing all those teams in the playoffs and go, you know, and, and USC, like not being really close, you know, sort of getting somewhat close, but not really. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a concern and you got to utilize the talent better. I think USC's had enough talent over the last, you know, six or seven years to make a playoff run or two and they have it. And if, yeah. the, if the talent's there, then you have to look at the coaching. Yeah. Um, which is probably, is it close? Oh, wow. We're, it's 1 p.m. I'm yeah. just running through questions here. Uh, yeah, good. We can do some rapid fire stuff if you want. Uh, 1977 Trojan says, will USC improve enough to beat Notre Dame? I'm not very optimistic, he says. Yeah. That, I mean, if you're looking at the Clay Hilton losing that home winning streak, that's the one game you want to circle. Um, we'll see. We'll know a lot more after this weekend. I kind of, I kind of feel they're going to do well. They switch quarterbacks, too. Um, so... By the time they get to USC, he'll have a lot more uh, experience under his belt. Um, that's a tough-looking team, though. I think it's a legit defense. I think the offensive line is coming along. They lost some players last year to, to the NFL draft. But switching quarterbacks, you have a more dynamic thrower now who's, who's athletic enough, too. Uh, I think they could give USC a lot of problems. But watch the, the Stanford-Notre Dame, Notre Dame game this weekend. That's, that'll tell you a lot. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. There's a lot of good games. And, yeah. of course, it's when USC is playing, which is frustrating as a college yeah, football fan. Yeah, Penn State, myself. Ohio State's going on, right? Yeah, which is crazy because they played the last time USC was in Arizona last season. So it's a little oh. – yeah. Um, Pat DeFig5 says, Should Brett Nealon be playing center over Tolo Uh Well, after the bad snaps <laughs> – Last game. We haven't really talked about that very much. Yeah, that's actually a did, good point. To did bring. that come up? In practice? Like, have you anyone? No one talked? really asked about no, it, I which is weird. Yeah, that was that came out of nowhere. Um, it's what we saw at the beginning of fall camp. It was those yes. types of snaps. Now, the interesting thing on the very uh, large one, the the second and twenty nine that USC got backed up to, JT Daniels actually came up to the line and pointed out things um, and told uh, Michael Pittman to come in closer. And Shaka and I were wondering, did Toa think that now JT was under center? Because if you look at when Toa snapped the ball, he snaps it directly underneath him, like underneath and up, which is not something you do if you think someone's in yeah. shotgun. I just so, think it went so far. I don't know if... Well. Yeah. Then we were saying you don't <laughs> chuck it at like 30 miles an hour. Right. Like, so I don't like, know what that was about. Like you're kind of sort of a handoff as opposed to... And like, you'd you think know. that you'd feel the hand underneath you, but I don't know. So <laughs> just a theory. But my, my conspiracy theory is do you move Toa to guard and have Brett Nealon go? Because I think overall Toa is a guard. So, yeah, I kind of think so too. I mean, um, if you're seeing that inconsistency from Andrew Voorhees, this is what I'm saying. USC's not cutthroat enough, but I would... I would Maybe experiment a little bit. I don't. Yeah, they. Not sure. But I think you're right. I don't think they're cutthroat enough that they would. Like they made a decision. He's a senior cap. He's a captain, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You can't really be like, sorry, move over, boy. Uh, I. It might work though. You know. I mean, I think that would help him for his NFL. You know, being versatile. I think that you know it certainly helps your draft stock and everything. Yeah. But you'd have to have a lot of confidence in Brett Nealon, You know, and. Uh, I mean. Uh, I mean, they, they have confidence enough to put them out there in the ogre package or whatever it's called. The Thor package. Thor package, sorry. Ogre's the Stanford one. I don't know. They're just silly kind of things. But, yeah. Um, yeah. But, I, but that's one of those things where I don't think they're going to make a lot of changes. I'm not saying they're warranted, but if they were, I don't think they would make the change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christian says, if USC gets back to the Pac-12 championship, who in the North would be the toughest game or opponent for USC? Ooh, good question. I yeah, think... I mean, it's so hard to tell right now. Cal's, like, super good on defense. Like, they are really, really good. But their offense is just kind of, eh. Patrick Laird hasn't done a whole lot. Uh, Oregon, I mean, they had that game against Stanford. They had them beat. That was at home. Different kind of situation. Uh, that's a team that looks pretty explosive to me. And they're much improved on the defensive side. There's athletes there. Like, that could be a tough one. You already go, didn't score a touchdown against Stanford, so... You'd like some revenge there, but typically, yeah. if you lose to Stanford in the, during the season or beat them, and then you play them again, you lose or you know whatever happened the first game happens in the second game. So I don't know if you want there. to see that one. 
And then Washington, it's you know really complete team as far as defense goes, but not the most dynamic quarterback, but someone that can, you know, he can make some mistakes and, and you can get some picks and stuff, but he's really good in their system. You saw what USC did two years ago. He's not very good at coming back. So USC would have to jump out on a team like, uh, you know, Washington. So yeah. I don't know. I think they all would pr propose different, um, you know, different challenges. Yeah. No update on Bubba Bolden. We got a lot of questions on no, that. None. Do you? Th sorry. No, no, sorry, go ahead. Do you think uh, USC will replace Neil Callaway at the end of the season? So I see. So yeah, I'm not thinking. Here's what I think about. You know, there's people hoping for coaching staff stuff. It, if USC does like good the rest of the way, but not like great, then I think there's potential for assistant coaches be like making changes. Maybe not from Clay Allen, but from above and say, you know what, you got to make some changes. But I think there's a small window of that happening. I think it's really more likely that the team doesn't do that well and it's just a, you know, get rid of everybody sort of thing. Really? Or, so you still think that after Wazoo, the win over Wazoo? Yeah, no, I think so. Like, I think, um, I, I looking at like Bill Connolly's, uh, like S&P plot, like you're looking at projections. The, the most likely scenario, according to him, this is advanced stat stuff, yeah. is a seven-win season. So wow. I think that's like, if that happens, that's bad. Like, to me, that's not good at all. No. And I think you make, there's, I think that Litzwan makes a change. But if it's like a nine. And when you say change, be specific here, like a Clay Helton change? Or firing the coaching staff, yes. Everyone like, involved. Everybody. For se a seven-win season after going to the yes. Rose Bowl and the Cotton Bowl. Yes. And winning five times because of the way they've looked, because they haven't looked like like we talk about a championship yeah. caliber team. I don't think seven wins at five five losses is acceptable with the kind of NFL talent that you have on the squad. So there's some excuses for having a, a freshman quarterback, but he's not been the problem at all. Even though we had people complaining about him, so yeah, I think like seven and five, really good chance that that Clay Hill is not the head coach anymore. Uh, but there's you know if it's like a nine win season. Um, so only losing one more game the way out, or you know maybe eight and four. Uh, m there's some opportunities there that you could you know have them get rid of some of the assistant coaches, and, and maybe that comes from above. Uh, but I, it's hard to picture. It just seems like it's going to be an all or nothing thing in my in my mind right now. It's just like my gut feeling. Is Interesting. Saying. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think yeah. I, what do you I feel think? like I have to see the Arizona game. I know I keep saying that for each game, but I yes. feel like. At least the next stretch, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, you'll get a real sense, obviously, how what this season is going to look like, whether it's doomsday or not. And it's just it's how they've looked is the biggest problem. Yeah. And I think those are the kind of calls and the you know the board of trustees and Lin Swan and but they don't even the have a president right now. Right, there's a lack of leadership and stuff. But there's got you know uh, who's the the billionaire developer? I forget his name, but uh, Caruso, oh, who's yeah. like the, the growth. Like he's basically I've running the show. I've seen his yacht. It's insane. It's like a seven level yacht. <laughs> yeah. So he's like the most powerful guy right now around USC. But they're all hearing. It's not just about what the record is. It's about you went to all these Trojans went to Texas and they got slaughtered and scoring three points against Denver like yeah. that had a much bigger impact than I thought it would just like close losses so yeah it's to me it's like you got to win get those games back and uh and win convincingly they didn't do it against Washington State they're 0 4 like I said against the spread so you got to start beating the spread a little bit too where you're like you beat teams by a lot that you should beat as opposed to squeaking by and getting these wins it's not this isn't the NFL. Like you have to make the fans and the boosters feel better, and they don't feel good right now. So he's got. I think he's got a lot of work to do to kind of build that up. Yeah, and to be fair, people are commenting. Keely, have the Cotton Bowl go. I'm playing devil's advocate here. <laughs> I have been one who's been very vocal that even though he's taken these teams to these levels, it hasn't looked good at all. Look at the Rose Bowl. That could have been a loss very easily. Cotton Bowl didn't go well. You know, so it, these are not impressive wins. I'm just saying on paper. It looks better than it actually is. Yeah. There was, I mean, 2016, there were some impressive wins. Uh, you know, yeah. On the road at Washington, they were a playoff team. You know, Penn State. That's but like the one game. <laughs> last year, like the impressive wins were Arizona State, which was like, yeah, they finished second in the Pac 12 South, but they fired yeah. their coach. You know, that was the most. And, you know, getting two wins over Stanford, and they were playing Keller Christ a lot too. Um, you know, those were the, the biggest kind of wins, and that was fine. But then you get turned around and he, stomps you this year at Texas, you know, putting a beat down on you. Like, those, that, those don't sit really well with a lot of the alumni base and stuff. So. Yeah. 
But yeah, get on Keely about that stuff. No, no. I'm just, I'm no, just kidding. I'm don't kidding. Don't unleash do the hounds on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for, for knocking over stuff. Knocking over stuff. Um. They want championships. That's what's that's what's on these cups. And uh, <laughs> USC's not very close right now to getting championships. Oh, wah, wah, wah. That's um, what fans want. Gerald, you don't have to win them, but you gotta like look like you're getting close to them. It doesn't look like they're getting close. Well, you have to with the talent that USC has. You have to look like good. <laughs> I know that's. <laughs> I was trying to think of a more articulate to way to say technical. that. Technical. Oh, you should look good. You should look good. No, but here they like, don't look. You're exactly right. They don't look good. They don't. They don't look good. They don't look like this is a team that you know on Saturday is going to come out and play their best ball, no penalties, and come out there and play their best. That's not this team. That's ha- Force a bunch of turnovers, sack yeah. the quarterback, huge plays. This or- is a team that's going to run up the score, not let up, and you'll get to see Matt Fink by the start of the fourth quarter. Right. It's, no, it's, not, like it's the, not how this team is. What's the emoji of the guys going like this? Like That's what yeah. you, like, people ask. Like, What do you expect? Like, I don't know. Like, oh, Maybe they come out and play well. Maybe they don't. Yeah. We have a text from Mr. Shotgun Spratling. <laughs> oh, what did he say? I'm not sure. Hold on. Uh, he says... Uh, 10 alarms proved not to be enough. So he slept through all his alarms. So yes. ma- again, tweet at Shotgun Spratling. Send, if you want to send him your links to... I sent 20 alarms. <laughs> yeah, send him links to like Amazon uh, alarm clocks. Anything you want to do that would be wonderful. Christian says the ghost of Shotgun knocked over that cup. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, we did one without him. Uh, so yeah, so I think, you know, for the motivation factor, you guys want to see people replaced that aren't performing well, we're going to have to like bring somebody else in and like, you know, show shotgun. Like, Hey man, you gotta, you gotta show up. Otherwise it's noon. You know, it's yeah, like, we check the film when you're not on it. <laughs> a new guy stepping up. <laughs> noon. You didn't make a noon show. Yeah. Tessa Troy says, so Keely believes that there should be a change. When I saw the UNLV game, I knew how this season was going to go for the most part because if you still have Neil Callaway, you still have John Baxter, I feel like those are things that they're just not going to change. It's going right. to be – they've shown who they are, and I don't think there's going to be improvement improvement in that regard. So at least for those coaches, I think maybe there should be a change. I don't like calling for people's heads like that, but I do think a change is warranted from what we've seen. Yeah, and there's obviously there's a lot of season left, but for what you've seen the first four games, it's – you know. It seems like that's the direction uh, this is going. Yeah. Alrighty. I think that's going to wrap it up. Oh, we got to do score predictions. Hey, before oh. we do score predictions, okay. it, uh, do us a favor. Like this post. Make sure you like our – if you're on Facebook, like this post. Like our page. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to us. We have good videos. And uh, on Periscope, just chill out. <laughs> you can subscribe. Yeah. You subscribe. They're already there. Put those hearts. Double tap. Um Turn on your note if you're on Facebook. Turn on your notifications too to get so when we go live, we we schedule it so people will find out. So let you know, let yourself uh, know what's going on. There. Yeah, Sean, I was correct about that conspiracy theory about Tester Troy and YouTube. I think I, I doxed him a little bit. Um, score predictions. What do you think? Okay, so again, three and a half point spread uh, as I always do, and I will probably for the rest of the season. I will not pick USC to cover, but my gut is again. Now I got the. I said it was three points last game. I was right. I, I'm going to go the same. My Maybe gut is again that USC is going to win this game. Nice. Um, I could see USC winning convincingly if, like what Keeley said, both lines and stuff uh, play well. But I think this is going to be like a 31-28 uh, USC game. That's what I'm going to go. What do you think? What did you say? 28-38? 31-28. Sorry. Someone actually in the YouTube comments went through and put the average star rating for O linemen for Pete Carroll, Sark, and Kiffin and Helton, which is pretty crazy. Oh, who had that? They're uh, all about the same, or? Uh, so Pete Carroll had a three point seven seven star rating. Kiffin had a three point five four star rating. Sark had a three point seven, and Helton had a three point seven. But what's the attrition rate? That's what I want to know. Yeah, because you don't have guys like Jacob Daniel. You know, uh, who's the other guy with the E? Um, Elijah what? or? Very, well, EJ Price, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah there's a couple of those. But I mean, there's still 15 guys. I think yeah. Clay Oud's actually done a pretty good job recruiting. I, he's focused more on the lines than like Kiffin did and stuff. And you saw those in the star yeah. numbers and stuff. But there's enough bo- Yeah, there are, there's enough bodies there that you should have a good offensive line. Yeah. My score, I think it's, I'm going to predict a USC win. Not sure how much I agree with that. I predicted USC to lose last week. So, at least... Yeah, you were close. I okay. was close. <laughs> I'm going to say 38-35. All right. Do so you think another uh, three-point game? All right. I so, you think don't think so. they're going to cover? No. Uh, a lot of people felt the spread should have been like seven points or more. Like, I know. 
Um, and the fact that it's down, I think part of it too is that there's money just comes in on USC. People bet USC a lot, but being 0 and 4 against the spread, it's a t like if if USC was like two and two against the spread, I bet you the spread would have been higher. It'd have been like five, six, seven, or something like that. Yeah. But because USC's failed to cover every week, it's hard to put a bigger spread on there. You don't really know, and Arizona looks better. Um, but if USC puts it together, I think this is a you know it would be a, a significant win and, and a win that you should feel pretty good about if they can win by a couple touchdowns on the road. Um, you Do you know, think we'll Arizona's see. that good that this would be a, a win that they feel good about? I think you should. I think they're a better team than what we've seen the first couple games. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I'd have to kind of watch them through the rest of the season. But my gut is that Arizona's on the rise now and they're going to play uh, a little bit better. Now, you know, one team turns the ball over a bunch more than the other. Yeah, it could be lopsided. But you saw it really close with Washington State when neither team really turned the ball over. So it was pretty even uh, overall. Yeah. Alrighty, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of Tunnel Vision. We will be back, of course, on Sunday at 7 p.m., so make sure you tune in for that. Maybe um, three of us for that one. Maybe. Maybe for the first time in a while, there'll be three of us. Uh, oh, wait. I think Shotgun says he has to work in. We'll see. We'll figure it out. Don't worry about that. <laughs> he's uh, got to skip it because he's missed three in a row. That maybe we'll better. have our, our backup come in. <laughs> yeah. Our, our change in the rotation. Uh, but that's Ryan Abraham. I'm Keely Yor. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back on Sunday. And hopefully, we'll see. Maybe it's a better performance for UFC this time around. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, but we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.